I go to the company of the one who is awakened, free from all inertia, completely sterilized in medical terms, so no contamination of its own that can create any kind of obstruction for you. When a doctor is giving you an injection or going to do an operation on you, he uses completely sterilized instruments. Sterilized means free from all contamination, inertia, nothing of the external remains, total emptiness. I go to the company where such a state of awareness, such religiousness pervades and to the congregation of, of such people I go to. In meditation, the Arabic word for it is marakwa. Marakwa means waiting. Waiting for what? Waiting for a state of total sterilization, emptiness to come even for a few moments. The Hindi word, the Sanskrit word is dhyan, and it is said dhyanam nirvishayam mana. It is that state of mind when it is free of all contamination, completely sterilized. You are not memory, you are not ego sense, you are not a storehouse, simply an empty space. And one attains to this emptiness or this happiness, we call it by different names. And it is in such a state, the experience of totality or experience of how happens. You begin to see that embodiment, the form of that emptiness. Out of that, the scriptures are born. When it is said, Hazrat Paigambar used to go on Mount He, is it a place somewhere on the physical plane that where you used to go physically? Have you ever pondered, introspected? It is the highest state in meditation when he has attained to emptiness. Guru Nanak says, you go to different pilgrimages, what would you attain for going in the outer pilgrimages? According to the Chinese part of acupuncture, there are different channels and meridians and the places where the channels and meridians intersect one another, they are the points of energy. These are inner holy places. And unless you are aware of those inner holy places, you have not yet ready. So when it is said, Hazrat Paigambar used to go on Mount he used to attain to that state of meditation where there is no inertia. There is nothing of foreign contamination of his ego, memory or anything. And then the one word comes, we use the word seers. Why do we use the word seers for master? Seer means one who is capable of seeing. And then the hin in Hindu way of word comes mantra drishta. Mantra means a formula, an equation, a methodology is given and you are beginning to see it. Mantra, drishta. It is said, that is what we know. But more than that, our intelligence cannot comprehend. That Hazrat Apaigambar used to go on Mount Heel and one day Allah said, read. No, in that state of meditation, you begin to see that which is. And then he 
explains it. It is something like this, I invite you for a cup of tea. Do not, I did not tell you anything. Everyone is given a cup of tea. You take the tea, drink it slowly and slowly and then I take you for a visit somewhere and you come back and in the evening I ask you, can you narrate the experience of tea that you had in the morning and then the place where we visited? We use our memory, words, but if there is contamination, we cannot narrate it authentically. And you will use your memory to recollect its taste. It's, you will have to start giving the description from the container first, then the content, then how the aroma filled you, then how when it is started going within you, what it did brought a freshness. This is very delicate and this is how all the scriptures happened. It is said that the Hindu seer Veda Vyas was in this in intense state of meditation. He saw something. He was overwhelmed. He felt that it is necessary that it should be made available for people for their development. But he forgot what he saw. Second day it happened the same way again. Then he prayed that, why are you giving me this vision? It should be preserved for those who are capable of understanding. And then it happened that a scribe appeared to him in the form of the Hindu god with elephant head and he said I am a fast writer anytime you will stop I will leave he agreed to that condition then he said whatever I am saying whatever I am seeing and narrating to you you cannot just write as it is you have to understand it first and then write he agreed the first word he spoke the scribe got confused. He got lost. Why he is using two words? This place is a residence, but at the same time, it is a place which can be called as Darga. People of like minded have gathered here in a particular way that is called commune, are communing here. He uses the word Dharma Chetra, the field of religion and the field of action. The first verse in Bhagavad Gita comes Dharma Chetra, Kuru Chetra, in the field of religion, in the field of action. What are these children who have gathered desirous to fight are doing? The scribe got confused why he is using two words. Why it is a field of religion and field of action? Religion is an experience of truth and truth is very simple. That which is This is light. It appears in the form of light. When light comes in, you are capable of seeing that which is. And in that light, all that contamination disappears, purification happens, he sees it. But then when this light begins to descend into your mind, thought begins to form, something is written and when it comes to the field of the body, the action happens. And the Sanskrit word Kuru means to begin, something is beginning. It is coming down, it is going to change your pattern of life, living and you are guided by it. You have experienced something, a state of lovingness, 
Now it has to be part of your life that is where it becomes your actions. One of the most beautiful description of that comes in Buddhist scripture in the company of Buddha and his disciple Anand. Anand was Buddha's cousin and one of the chief disciple. How the scriptures came. Before he became Buddha's monk, he asked for three things. He said, I am your elder brother. I can ask you anything, but once I become your monk, I will have to follow whatever you say. He asked first thing that you will not ask me to go anywhere as you will send the other monks to go different places to spread the message of peace. Buddha said that is okay. Second he asked, I will sleep in the same room where you sleep. And the third, you will not meet anyone without my presence. I have to be a witness to all that you do, whoever you meet. I have to be present there. Buddha granted these three things, but these became an obstruction in his enlightenment. Anand says that I have seen Buddha sleeping and he sleeps in one posture and he never turns. Buddha responded that with the stillness of the mind, bodies inertia, tensions have vanished. There is no disturbance within. I do not need to turn the sides. If you are sleeping and you are dreaming and you watch the eyes continue to move, people who sleep with eyes open, it happens to them. One day, Buddha and Anand was traveling and he passed through a river stream. It was many leaves have fallen, the water has become dirty. When he passed that stream about a mile or so he reached, he said, Anand, I am very thirsty and I am old. He said, you stay here, I will go and fetch the water for you. Ready to go to fetch the water. He said there is a stream a little lower down. We can get the water from there. He said no. I want you to get the water from that stream that we had passed. Anand goes there and he saw that the water was muddy and leaves were floating onto the surface. He returned empty handed and he said that water is not worth drinking. Because a cart has just passed through the stream and all that mud from the below has come to the surface and the leaves have fallen from the tree that are floating. Buddha said, no, I want the water from the same stream. He goes back to fetch the water and when he reaches there, to his utter surprise, he found that the water was crystal clear. The leaves have flown, the dirt has settled and water was crystal clear. Anand brings the water. Buddha said, Anand, did you get the message? Did you get the message? Continuity is very important. Any circumstance or situation comes, all that is Contamination within comes to the surface. But if meditation continues, journey continues, the flow continues, the crystal clarity comes. When Buddha passed, Buddha Anand did not become enlightened, but he remained in his company all the time. Buddha attained to Mahaparinirvana. Now a congregation was convened to write Buddha's message. Anand was not invited in that congregation because he was not enlightened. 
and if a person is not enlightened means he is not astralized and that needle and that syringe cannot be used to give an injection or that knife it slipped from the hands of the doctor it has been contaminated and it cannot be used a very delicacy is observed when we are administering an injection to a patient or using an operation completely sterilized the gloves are sterilized the clothes the scrub that the doctor uses is also sterilized so anand was not enlightened and he was not allowed he cried the next day he was to go the conference was to be convened and then he wept whole night by the morning in that very weeping anand became enlightened and then he goes because everybody know knew that anand is the one who has been always 40 years with buddha in and out other monks they had to go to different places buddha had sent them so they were not always available and all buddhist scriptures begin thus i have heard buddha said something whatever he said only he knows what he said and only he knows what it meant thus i have heard hindu scriptures begin at thus and there is a continuity whatever i have spoken yesterday it is a continuity from there there is no break and then he gives a very minute description of what happened and one of the sutra is known as diamond sutra the sutra of utter emptiness it is a dialogue between buddha and his disciple subhuti anand is the one who witnessed it and he writes it but in fact nothing has happened subhuti did not ask anything and buddha did not answer anything and yet still the entire scripture happened when hazrat na paigambar sallallahu alaihi wasallam attained to that state which is known as mount heel nothing was told to him and yet still the entire scripture happened the scriptures happen in a state of utter silence all that is precious all that is beautiful all that is life giving happens in the state of utter silence utter emptiness there is in a state of modern terminology we can say in a state of utter sterilization when all the instruments are completely sterilized then something happens a new life begins and he gives a beautiful description of it i will take a few pages of this and he calls that a state as a state of meditation when there is a equanimity you are not leaning on this side or that side the e- complete equanimity oneness and that's the time you are all alone and this word alone is beautiful a l o n e all one all oneness is not that your mind left side of the brain is saying something else right side saying something else hand saying something else no it is not there is a complete harmony and that state when that state of equanimity happens you are ready to narrate what it is you have heard what you have said these sutras have been remembered by buddha's disciple anand and one thing to be remembered they all begin thus i have heard he simply says thus i have heard the difference is great he does not say buddha has said this because he says how am i to say what buddha had said all that i can say is that what i have heard 
my hearing may be defective so i did not hear clearly what is being said what he meant only he knows all that i can remember is what i have heard that is why when one day this continued for 22 years in a state of meditation and when he will come from there he will narrate to his sahibis and a collection of that is known as quran e pak quran e maji one day it happened when he came out people were quarreling arguing all kind of things were happening he forgot what he saw what he envisioned let us look at it in a different terminology not what he was told by allah subhanahu wa taala what he saw what he envisioned what he experienced in the state of meditation that is why it always used to happen whenever a meditation session is finished lala ji razi allah taala no will look at sufi brij mohan lal and he will sing a bhajan or couplet that explains the inner state that had happened at the time of meditation of marak wadi then or when an explanation is given after meditation it explains what different people have experienced that particular hour in meditation to varying degrees it explains the inner state and because of the conflict and people's commotion he forgot after that hazrat abu bakr siddiq razi allah taala uno asked what you were supposed to tell us and that's the time he mentions about he forgot and that is a specific reason why he forgot that is a specific reason why vedas vyas forgot the message of the first two days is not that he forgot for a deliberate it is for a specific reason so that seekers can discover that on their own when hazrat ta paigambar sallallahu alaihi wasallam forgot what did he envision and that's the time it was about shabi kad that night he said a night comes in when the following day sun does not rise with rays and if you pray it is said that the result is thousand times more he forgot then when he asked and out of his love he said that happens after 25th night after 20 on the odd nights it can be 27th 29th or the last so now it is left to you to discover but how can you discover what is the night unless you have attained to that inner purity emptiness a state when there is no contamination of your own you will be able to discover that you can discover the meaning why did he use the word dharma chetra and kuru chetra you simply look at it when bhagavad gita was narrated according to hindus the two armies have gathered facing one another desirous to fight arjun the chief warrior gets confused unable to make a decision what he should do he asks his charioteer to carry the chariot between the two armies so he can get a clear perspective the war sirens have been blown it is ready how much time did krishna took to explain the 700 verses and were these 700 verses actually spoken by krishna or all that we see all that quran e pak quran e majid contains was it originally in that script many things are interpolated afterwards and it happened master does not need to say to you anything when the disciple is ready a look that is enough to communicate everything it is all that is beautiful happens 
in a moment of silent communion. Nothing is said, nothing is asked, but everything is heard and happened. That's how the Diamond Sutra happened. Subhuti did not ask and Buddha did not speak, but the whole scripture came. I look at and the flowers begin to show. Arjun looked at when you a seeker comes to the desire, to the master, he is full of questions. He sits down in the company of the master. Automatically that questions begin to disintegrate and instead there comes a harmony. Many times master answers the question which you have not asked. A question comes to your mind and answer immediately comes to you. Arjun would have looked at Krishna. Krishna had looked at him. The whole Bhagavad Gita finished. Now on the battlefield there were few people who were pure and innocent in their heart. One was the grand sire Bhishma. The other one was the blind king who asked his charioteer the question, explain to me what is going on on the battlefield. My and the, my children and that of my brother Pandu who have gathered on the battlefield desirous to fight, what are they doing? He asked a question. Was he transformed? No. Because he was guided by his own inertia. He wanted to have everything for his own children and deprived because of his blind love for his son and he misses it. The one who narrates, who is seeing everything, the charioteer, was he transformed? And Vedavyas, who is the one seeing it, he is far away from there far away from there, but he is seeing what is happening on the battlefield and he is trying to describe it. And then there is a Bhishma, the grand sire. He was pure, innocent, but because of his one weakness that he only considered his promise that I will remain connected to the throne and he will not say anything. That is my Word is more important, but unless you move from individuality to totality, if for the sake of, I have decided today that I am not going to speak, I am going to take a rest. But if someone asks a question, is my word that I have decided to remain silent is more important or the transformation of the other is important? So you live for totality, live for the whole, not for your own sea. That was the difference. He knows that something is happening with Krishna and Arjun, but he does not know what it is happening. Because that ego, that ignorance had created a veil that he could not see what happened. The veil was very thin. And that his own ignorance, his own inertia has created it. And there was a, another one known as who was the stepbrother born out of the maid widow, pure and innocent, understood truth. He was not there on the battlefield and he understood. The message of Holy Prophet was understood by Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq and his other Khalifas. Now a master, a sheikh, Although he is separated by so many life, such a long span of time, but he is at the same, there is no, as far as existence is concerned, as far as inner thing is concerned, there is no time gap. There is no difference between Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq Razila Ta'ala Uno and Hazrat Paigambar Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. As far as their awareness is concerned, yes, physically, they are two bodies. But as far as awareness is concerned, there is no difference. So when a subsequent master comes in, a sheikh comes in, he has attained to the same state in which 
for the first time the scripture happened the, ex the revelation of truth happened through his meditation through his austerities he attains to the same state it is like you take a drop of water from any side of ocean anywhere in the world you will get the same taste no difference and when anand begins to say that how he wrote the scripture i may have forgotten something or may not have understood or i am putting my own explanation i think he meant this no anand does not say thus i have heard i have heard buddha said this and he leaves everything for you to attain to that state of meditativeness and understand the words of buddha understand the words of the master understand the words of the any scripture that may appeal to you this is a great sincerity he could have claimed this is what buddha said i was present i am an eye witness and indeed he was an eye witness nobody can deny that but look at this humbleness of the man he says thus i have heard buddha was saying i was hearing i can only relate what i have heard maybe the battery of my hearing aid was weak i did not hear maybe i forget to put on my hearing aid maybe something else happened this is a beautiful example that we can use that abdul ani forget to put on his hearing aid and he was not able to hear so anand may have forgotten to put on his hearing aid or hearing aid was defective so he could not hear so he says i have heard i do not authenticate that this is what buddha said this is what i have heard or i may have forgotten a few things and something of my own mind may have got into it this is all possible i am not an enlightened yet anand was not enlightened then so he says this is all that i can say and vouch for that i have heard thus i have heard at one time the lord dwelt at shravasti very minute details he is giving the masters the, this is important when you observe the minute details every detail of the master in his surrounding is a message he speaks through these things it is only for us to see that what we can discern from this the lord dwelt at shravasti a city of glory early in the morning the lord dressed put on his cloak took his begging bowl what is the significance of all these things i am taking this because my perspective is oceanic not concerned with the river thames or hudson or nile or any particular river instead with ocean where all the rivers have merged and have created something which is oceanic the nowhere else such a minute description is given he took his begging bowl and entered the great city of shravasti to collect arms when he had eaten and returned from his round the lord put away his bowl and the cloak washed his feet and sat down on the seat arranged for him crossing his legs he always sat cross leg <coughs> holding his body upright in meditation so that if you have a water hose and water hose bends at a place the flow of water will not be there energy flows through the channels and if you sit down bend then the energy will not be flowing properly so you sit upright with the back straight and mindfully fixing his attention in front of him that's where the 11 kalmat of hazrat ibn khalid gizdwani razi allah taala who comes nazar war kadam your eyes are fixed on your feet hosh dardam every moment there is a hosh awareness khilwat dar anjuman these 11 kalmat comes in total hazrat 
ابن خالق غزوانی رضی اللہ تعالیٰ انہوں گیو ایٹ اینڈ تھری ور گیون بائی حضرت شاہ بہاؤدین نقش بند رضی اللہ تعالیٰ انہوں وقوف جمنی وقوف قلبی اینڈ وقوف ادبی یو ول بی سرپرائز ایٹ دس وین آنند سیز ہی گوز ان ٹو اسمال ڈیٹیلس ون نیور نوز وین یو آر رپورٹنگ اباؤٹ اے بدھا یو ہیو ٹو بی ویری کیئر فل ایون دس مچ ہی رپورٹس اگین اینڈ اگین سچ اسمال تھنگس اینڈ ہی گوز آن اگین اینڈ اگین آنند ہیڈ فالوڈ بدھا لائک اے شیڈو A silent shadow just watching him. Just to watch him was a benediction. If you now reflect, when you watch the Sheikh, Sheikh Nazim or Sheikh Hisham, just watching him walking or sitting in a particular gesture or looking at a particular seeker in a gesture communicates many things that The words cannot communicate and he watches everything in its finest details. When he had eaten and returned from his round, the Lord put away his begging bowl and cloak, washed his feet and sat down on the seat arranged for him. When for the first time Buddhist sutras were translated into Western languages, the translators were a bit puzzled. Why this continuous repetition thus I have heard and he gives that narration couple times. It goes on and on like that. Again it will be and again this repetition. Why are so many such small things are repeated? They could not understand. They thought that this is repetitive. And it is an unnecessary repetition. It is not needed at all. What is the point of it all? But they all missed. What Anand is saying is that Buddha pays attention to small things. All Buddhas, all Sheikhs, all Masters pays attention to small things. As much as to big things. For a Buddha... There is nothing small or not, and nothing is big, just one thing. When he takes his begging bowl, he is respectful to it. When he says he took his begging bowl, now you look at yourself. You get up in the morning, you dress, you put on those clothes whole day. They adorn you, they protect you, they give you a particular kind of elegance. Shoes protect you. But when you come, are you respectful to those clothes? You are taking them out lovingly, putting them in the right place, or just haphazardly throw them scattered here and there? This is unmindfulness. And unmindfulness is the greatest sin. Mindfulness is the way. The shirt that I put on yesterday has given me compliments. That is a nice shirt. Where did you buy? It looks very elegant, dressy. But do you respect it when you come back home? When you have taken it out, how do you handle it? Buddha picks up his begging bowl because the begging bowl, in it he has to collect the arms. And in this begging bowl, he has to eat the meals that he has collected. He is respectful to it. As he would be respectful to any other god or any other thing, he is respectful. We are respectful to certain things, but we are not respectful to the minute things. When he puts his cloak or puts his dress on, He is so mindful and absolutely alert. I have seen these minute details. Minute details. Sufi Braj Mohan Lal, he used to walk with a stick and he will have a cap, topi. When you look at the topi, it has a smooth edge and the other where there is a seam. 
and his cap has to be hanged on a particular peg, the hook on the wall. The walking stick has to be hanged. It has a hand like this. So you can hang it this way or that way. When you hang the racks with clothes, you put it all high, not all facing one way. The When you take the shirt, the shirt have buttons in front and it has a hook like that. So you can put it the facing this way. So these are the insignificant things. But if you overlook these things, you are bound to overlook the bigger things. And he will, if you put his cap on the other peg, he will say you disturb my rhythm. When he is sitting down and the food is placed on his platter, everything is put in the bowls. Now, when you look at it here, the modern art of serving culinary, when the servers, they arrange the table, there are different things. A person will pick up first a plate and a napkin, or napkin can pick up afterwards. But he will not pick up the glass or the cutlery at the same time. He picks up the plate, then the foods are arranged in a sequence. If it is, for instance, the vegetables, the, all the other things are put. He will place everything in a particular way. Normally, what how we eat, we break a piece of flat bread, then we dip it in dal or vegetable, so it has to be there. Then the appetizer or the accompanying dish like raita, you don't take it first. Or salad, maybe you may take first or you take afterwards and then the chutneys you will eat at the end. So everything is arranged in a sequence. The same thing I saw, I spent nearly 15 to 18 years with my uncle Sufi Omkarna. Watch the minute details. Whenever you have an opportunity to be in the company of the Sheikh, observe the minute details. He is not mechanical. When he puts on his cloak or puts his dress on, he is so mindful and absolutely alert. That is why he said, I eat when I eat. But when you eat, you are thinking of something else. This was one of my first radio program, a 15 minutes. How do the, it was then known as hour of introspection. How do we do one of the most important act in our life, eating? We have a platter full of delicious food in front of us. We have a morsel in our mouth and next one in the hand holding on so that there is no gap. As soon as the one in the mouth finishes, the other is ready to go in and eyes are fixed on what it is on the platter. So we do not enjoy. And when this script was given, the narrator said, is this you call a spiritual program? Twenty years after, she understood, yes, it was a spiritual program. Minute details. He is paying attention to this. When we are eating food now, simply look at it. You are going to a restaurant. The beautiful, enticing, savory dishes are in front of you. And we are talking about the food that you ate last time when we visited that restaurant or that place. So you miss the opportunity of that which is in front of you that can satiate you. But you are eating mechanically, not being mindful of what you are doing. And Buddha is mindful of small things. And then when next time you go to another restaurant, then you will remember the food that was now you was being served. That's how we live our lives. You know mechanically how to put it on. So what is the point of paying attention to it? Your mind goes on moving into a thousand directions and you take a shower, but you are very disrespectful to the shower, to the towel, 
to the shampoo, to all those things. You have not been there. You have been somewhere else. You eat, but you are not. But you are disrespectful to the food. You are not there. Disrespectful means you are not there, available at the moment. Not doing, not available. When Hazrat Ubaidullah Ara Razillah Ta'ala Uno said, I eat when I eat. I sleep when I sleep. A simple words. There is no scripture in it, but a great meaning, a small things. You become aware of small things and forget about the big things. Once you take care of the small things, big things will fall into place automatically. But if you are focusing on big things, then you miss the small things and you miss the whole boat. You are not there. You simply go on swallowing the food inside you. You go on doing things habitually and mechanically. When Buddha does a thing, he is utterly there. He is nowhere else. When he had eaten and returned from his rounds, the Lord put away his bowl and the cloak, washed his feet and sat down on the seat, arranged for him, crossing his legs, holding his body upright, and mindfully fixing his attention in front of him, then he spoke. These minor details are worth relating. Nowhere else we see so much minute details are mentioned as part of the scripture. Why did Hazrat Apagumba Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam forgot? Did he forgot really? It was intentional so that you can a seeker on his own. This is where he has to discover. If he has not discovered that state, that when the will be the Shave Kadra, the night. And that happens only when you are aware of the minute details and then you will be able to know that this is the time. This is the time when the Sheikh is going to leave the body. The final has come and you will know that now is the time for me to leave. Because they bring the quality of, a quality of Buddhahood, of awakening. And if you pay attention to these fine details, something grows in you. I have watched Buddhas for 15 years, day in and day out. It is the lesson in mindfulness. In Buddhist monasteries, First of all, the first lesson is given to you. No scriptures, but a lesson in mindfulness. Each moment he lives in awareness. And what he is doing is irrelevant. Each moment he pours his attention into whatsoever he is doing. When he makes a gesture, he is totally the gesture. When he smiles, he is totally the smile, not a fake smile. When he talks, he is totally his words. And when he is silent, he is totally silent. To watch a living Buddha is a blessing in itself. How he walks, how he sits, how he makes gestures, and how he looks at you. Each moment is a radiant moment of awareness. The gestures with which Sufi Omkarnath or Sufi other masters looked at me or at others is benediction. And memory of those moments is still lingers into my being like the dissolving notes of a sweet melody. That is why Anand reports, there must have been great silence when Buddha came arranged his attire, washed his feet, sat on the seat, arranged for him, sat upright, then focused his whole attention in front of him. What is this, fixing your attention in front of yourself? This is a special Buddhist method called Anapana Sati Yoga. Or this came to be known as Vipassana meditation, watching your breath.
and it is very important when leon leford went in search of the masters of gurjeev one of the masters said he asked what did you teach gurjeev he said i teach him how to breathe breathe what do you mean we all know breathe are you aware of your breathing when breath comes in and goes out when buddha is doing something for example dressing he is attentive of that act when he is walking he is attentive of walking when he is not doing anything then he is attentive of breath coming in and breath going out but he is attentive each moment even while he is asleep he is attentive and that is why hindu say who is yogi one who never sleeps one who never sleeps that means he is always awake no he is awakened when he turns his side he knows that he is turning his side and it is said we have to sleep with our turning on the right hand side with the hand under the ears one leg crossed over the other for 10 years he lived with buddha and he was surprised that he remained in the same posture whole night wherever he put his hand it remained there the whole night he must have looked many times must have sneaked in the night and it is worth watching a master a buddha how does a buddha sleep and he was surprised and puzzled that he kept the same posture the same posture the whole night when i sleep when normally you sleep when in the morning you get up as if the bed has been a wrestling bout i do not have to make my bed in the morning when i get up the sheet does not move it remains fixed as wherever it is you are not kicking the pillows or the things at the base it remains fixed wherever they are the same posture the whole night he could not hold his curiosity one day he inquired it is not right for me to get up in the night and look at you i should not do such a thing but i am curious about you and i am puzzled you remain in the same posture do you sleep or you do you continue your awareness and buddha responded sleep happens in the body my body sleeps i remain alert i am awake now the sleep is beginning to come and then it has come and set now the body is relaxed the limbs are relaxed but i keep my awareness bright meditation is 24 hours of it it is not that you do it once a day and you are finished my new details how you are doing how you are opening the door of your car how you sit down hold on to your steering fix your everything it has to become your flavor it has to become your climate it should surround you wherever you are wherever you go you carry the state of meditation that happened here throughout the day do not allow it to get diluted and when you through your efforts you can maintain it and then some total of this becomes a scripture of 22 years of awakening 22 years of a state of meditation totally aware and the outcome of that is the entire scripture and you are the scripture because you are an extraordinary creation of god the body is the temple there is no other temple what it does no other factory can do your body its mechanism can convert a piece of chicken a piece of a bowl of ice cream fruits all these diverse things into blood can any factory can convert a piece of chicken into blood or ice cream into blood no but your body does it's a miracle you must learn to listen to it listen to its intelligence 
when it gives signals, when it indicates something, and these minor things when put together becomes the scripture that you are. It has to become your flavor, it has to become your climate, it should surround you wherever you are. Whatsoever you are doing, meditation continues like an undercurrent. Now, once again the Sutra, and that's how the Buddhist scripture, the Diamond Sutra, the dialogue between Subhuti, one of Buddha's disciple, and Buddha happened. Nothing was asked, nothing was said. Anand reported the entire scripture. Ask a question to a Buddha needs a certain attitude. To ask a question to a master needs a certain attitude. Only then you receive the answer. The answer that you receive outwardly in words is not the answer. He speaks to you, he answers you, he responds to you in his totality, in his gestures, in his silence, in the gaps between the words, in the choice of the words, in the arrangement of the words, all these are musical. Only then you will receive the answer within you. When I used to sit down, I said, do not answer my questions the way it is to be answered. Teach me that knowing which everything becomes known. There has to be a silent communion. I should not ask you anything and you should not respond to me anything in any normal way. Instead of a question has arisen within me, the answer has to come right there. And it is through the light that the Master is and that light has become part of you, the answer comes. Answer is born within you. Only that answer can bring you transformation. Not the answers that are given to you somewhere or the other. Buddha will. It is not that Buddha will not give the answer. You can ask very disrespectfully, Buddha will still respond. However, in that state of disrespectfulness, you will not receive the answer. Therefore, it is not a question that you, that only when you are disrespectful, only when you are respectful with Buddha, give the answer. Buddha will give the answer anyway. But if you are not respectful, humble, receptive and feminine, you will miss it. The answers are received in a state of receptivity and femininity. That's why a disciple is a female, a feminine. Because feminine, the quality is the quality of receiving. How you ask the question determines whether you will be able to receive the answer or not. How to ask? In what mood are you receptive? Are you just curious? Are you asking the question out of your accumulated knowledge? Or, oh, is it a question of innocence? Are you asking just to test whether this man knows or not? Are you asking from a state of knowledge or from a state of knowing, a state of not knowing? Are you humble and surrendered? Are you ready to receive the gift if it is given to you? Will you be open? Will you welcome it? Will you take it to your heart? Will you allow it to become a seed in your heart? To ask a question to a Buddha is not to ask a question to a professor. It needs a certain quality in you, then only will you be benefited by it. And that's how the whole scripture went on. Thus many monks approached to where the Lord was, saluted his, at his feet with their heads, thrice walked around him to the right and then sat down in one place. Thus continues the way.